My name is Jackie Dixon and you're watching VLX TV, where my goal is to help you get healthy, holy, and hot so you can serve the world for God in a huge way. This week I'm talking about the rest of the story behind VLX and my personal story and why this means so much to me and why I've really taken it as my life mission to become a godly woman like this and to teach other women to do the same. So let me take you back a little bit. You know from last week's video that I grew up with a lot of ill relatives, but honestly, I didn't have a whole lot of body issues myself until I was in college. In high school, I'd played competitive basketball and that kept me pretty thin and I was already very tall. So I got into modeling and I pretty much had a pretty healthy relationship with my body. I was pretty legalistic toward food, but I really didn't see a problem with that because I was so rarely in situations where I was faced with other options. Then came college. <laughs> For the first two years, I held it down. I was up every morning around 6 or 6.30 to go to the gym for an hour of working out. And then I would have my little egg white and celery breakfast. And then I would have chicken and salad for lunch and dinner. And if I got hungry, I'd have a little bit of some nuts or an apple. But basically, I was really, really strict. And the downside was that I was really, really hungry. <laughs> And there were so many nights walking around the campus late at night, I'd be on the phone with a friend just trying to avoid eating before I went to bed. That's such a crazy way to live. And needless to say, it didn't last long. Halfway through college, my mom became extremely ill with an illness that we hadn't foreseen. It was a vitamin B12 deficiency, and it took her down really hard and really fast. Very quickly, she was unable to walk. She was unable to use her hands to feed herself or to drive or to use utensils or write. Vitamin B12 deficiency can create a lot of different problems in the body, from blindness to problems with DNA replication. But for my mother, it struck in her nerves and she started to have the symptoms of extreme neuropathy. It was hard diagnosing her and the doctors took a while. They didn't know if it was MS or other problems, but it turned out we finally discovered through some different tests than the norm that it was a B12 deficiency. And as soon as we could, we started giving her intravenous shots that was me, that was my job of B12 right in her thigh to try to boost her body's levels back up. Let me tell you right now, when your mother is in tears because she thinks that she's dying and only in a few months, and you're the one who's caring for her full time, your heart goes through a tailspin and you're not really sure what to think of the world, of other people who you had thought were on your side but suddenly are nowhere to be found when you need them, of God as you're wondering, what on earth is happening to this, this calm little life that we had lived? Fortunately, after I went back to college that autumn, my mom made a miraculous recovery and she did pull out and the doctors really did call it a miracle. But in that time, my emotions and my heart had taken a pretty hard hit and I had gained a lot of weight from the stress and emotional eating I'd turned to when I didn't have anyone else to run to for comfort. Or so I thought, I wish I'd gone to God more. So I packed on the pounds and I became really angry and bitter at the world. It seemed to me that all of the people who had claimed that they were there to help us suddenly were just had vanished and really didn't have any desire to be helpful. And of course, there were other family and friends who we may have least expected, but who really showed up and helped us out in our time of need. But that gave me this incredibly cynical view of the world. And after watching my mom's suffering and really having in my heart the reality of what happens if she dies? Am I gonna take care of my little brother? How are we going to make all this work? Just this huge paradigm shift that had happened in just a span of a few months. I really was in a tailspin and I was so angry at anything that seemed to me to be frivolous or pretty or petty from puppies and butterflies to pretty little invitations or parties for no particular reason. All of it seemed to me to be almost evil. How could people be celebrating and enjoying life when there was so much suffering going on and I had seen it so closely? Weren't they aware? Were they just selfish? So I developed a deep despair and a true underlying bitterness and anger toward the world. I gained more weight over the next couple years. I wore a lot of black and I started kind of questioning the things that I had always grown up assuming. Now, I did not grow up in your traditional conservative church setting. We bounced around to a couple different churches and they taught some wacky things sometimes and then we'd move on to a different one. So my relationship with God was founded in the word, in music and prayer, in what I later understood to be called quiet times, but I never had the kind of Christian vocabulary that a lot of you will be familiar with if you've grown up in a traditional church. So fellowshipping and community and small groups, I had no idea what those were. I knew the Bible, I knew my devotionals, and I knew 
how to be real in prayer with God. However, this whole period of becoming despairing toward the world really darkened my views and made me wonder if I had maybe missed something. Now for a while, nothing really went wrong and I just was kind of an angry, angry little person, but I was still solid with the Lord. It was after college when I had this opportunity that I thought was going to be amazing to go and live in Paris and live a completely different life from one that I had thought I could have to become and get my degree there in French literature and pursue a PhD and maybe professorship. But while I was in Paris and it was a particularly gloomy winter, maybe all winters in Paris are gloomy. I've still only spent one there. I was surrounded by this extremely secular environment that conceived of itself as being so intellectual and enlightened that it had to pass the need for God. And when you're, in that culture over and over again and you don't have community, which I now understand is so important, you can start to question a lot of things and I certainly did. I had opportunities to live in ways that I did not want to live, but at the time they seemed kind of enticing and I was so torn were these people who were telling me that what I believed was ridiculous and I should just do all this crazy stuff right or were these old rules as they were now being presented to me, were they actually true and was that where real life and flourishing was found? Had I been tricked? Had I believed all these crazy things for no reason? Or was that really the foundation of true life? Well, those months in Paris were, needless to say, a real dark night of the soul. Because essentially, I had come to a fork in the road. And I could either no longer pursue God's way and make up my own rules as I went and search for kind of the next interesting thing to me, the next high, if you will. Or I could continue to stick to the rules and laws and commands of God, believe that that was truly the way to real life, and that that was where I was going to find peace and flourish. I had a choice. And there were two moments for me that really made me realize that I had hit pretty close to a spiritual rock bottom. One was sitting on a bench next to the Ark of Triumph with a little notebook in my hand, and I decided to write down everything I still cared about. Now, there were a few things on that list, but honestly, it was quite short. And I realized that if I were to walk away from God, the list of things that I really was passionate about in the world was pretty short. And I'm not talking about interests like, oh, I'm interested in French culture, or oh, I'm interested in, you know, Spanish cooking styles or tango music or whatever. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that really give your life purpose and meaning. Things that make you want to get out of bed in the morning with a sense of joy and purpose and that you're driving towards something that actually matters. I realized that if I were to walk away from God, that just disappeared for me. And then the second moment was when I was walking along the Seine and I was considering going off on this path of not following God's laws and just making up my rules as I went along. And there's no way I can really describe what I felt except to say that it was this existentialist malaise. And if you're familiar with the term existentialism, it's essentially the idea that nothing means anything, that life is just this absurd play or game, or that really there's no significance. There's no right or wrong. There's no moral absolutes. It's just this kind of nebulous existence. And while some people have taken the idea and run with it, I have never seen anyone live that way and as I considered going that way myself, I felt that feeling sink in already, who had this passion for life, this true love for other people and desire to help them. Why would you bother if nothing means anything? What would the point be? And so I felt this settle in over me, this idea that there was no point to life. And I had a heck of a lot of life left in front of me that would be meaningless and purposeless and empty. And what on earth was I going to do to occupy myself, to try to keep myself moderately interested in this life without meaning? And I realized it would come down to just chasing the next high, essentially. The next party or the next pseudo adventure vacation or the next purchase or the next accolade. And essentially it would be this, this long string of monotonous, not caring, punctuated by occasional bursts of enthusiasm for something trivial that didn't really matter. And I thought, that is an awful way to live. And even if I weren't to believe in the truths of God, I would want to stick with them just so I had enthusiasm for life. As Paul says, we are all fools if Christ is not risen from the dead. But honestly, it's a lot more pleasant to be a happy fool than it is to be one of these enlightened, miserable people that I was so close to becoming. So I wrestled with God on that walk down the Seine because I had fortunately developed throughout my childhood a very strong prayer life and a, an ability to kind of 
have conversations with God because I wasn't really aware of what a traditional way of praying might be. So I would typically read the Bible, say something to God, and occasionally I would get very clear guidance that was in line with the Word, and I came to believe that's the voice of God. So I started wrestling with this inner voice, which I believe was God. And I said, well, Lord, I can just walk away from you. I mean, you're not going to stop me. What happens if I just decide to not do things your way? And the answer was pretty clear. It was, you can do that. I'm not going to stop you. You have free will. Go ahead. But let me warn you that you're not going to get my favor. You're not going to get my protection. I can't protect you if you're so outside my will. You're not going to get my blessings. I have so many things in store for you, but if you essentially give me the middle finger because you know my commands and you willingly decide not to live them out, what do you want me to do? I can't help you out. I will still love you, but you are refusing to be close to me and I can't be intimate with you then. You've run away and as much as I want you to come back, I can't be with you until you willingly turn back to me. So all of these grandiose plans you have for your life, he knew, we talked about it for years, that I wanted to serve him in a huge way and help heal and teach people who are suffering unnecessarily. He said, basically, look, that's a great plan, but we can't do that anymore if you're not going to be in accordance with me, if we're not going to be tight and I can trust you to live out big plans because you won't even follow the small commands that you already know by heart because they're in the word. So after that walk, I decided I'm going to stick with God. And I really could not care less what the world is trying to tell me is a better way to go. I am going to live in accordance with God's commands. Now, here's the second part of the story, which is even more interesting, if you think so. Sometimes I do. I then returned back to the States. I had had it with Paris. I was depressed in the most romantic city in the world at Christmas time, and I figured I would rather be right with God. I would rather be doing God's work anywhere in the nastiest little town <laughs> than not right with God in the most exquisite city on the planet. So I went back home and I started working at a church. And as I told you, I didn't grow up in one of these traditional church environments. So I was suddenly bombarded with the Christian lifestyle, the Christian vocabulary and the Christian kind of setup of all these different community structures and terms for these people and terms for those people. And I was just I had a lot coming at me at one time and I loved it because these people were so ready to authentically love me and accept me for who I was and just take me in as a family member essentially without barely even knowing me and that was just the love of Christ they were showing me. But I also noticed that a lot of the things that were taught, not formally but often informally within kind of conversations and with between friends and even with some older women who were more like mentors, that a lot of the things that were being said weren't in line with the Bible, and they weren't really leading to wellness. These were things about our bodies, these were things about beauty, and these were things about relationships and intimacy, essentially. And I thought, this is really odd. Here I am in, you know, an incredible Christian community, conservative, Bible-based, everything, and they're not teaching what I've come to know is absolutely true about the way that I care for my body, the way I interact with other people. And even if I don't do it yet, I know it's in the Bible and I want to learn how to do it. But where can I find people who will teach me who are already going there themselves? So I came head to head with this realization that God's way was the way, but not even all of God's people were aware of God's ways, and particularly in these areas that are so often under addressed in the church. So. I started just doing my job, kind of doing my thing, and I met with a lot of young women. And over and over again, the same topics kept coming up. And they were these topics that I was also finding were not sufficiently addressed. And I thought, well, this is stupid. You know, we've got to have somebody talk about this. And I don't think I know what I'm doing yet, but I seem to kind of have something figured out. So let's just start conversations around this. And at least we'll broach the topic and we'll start to open the Bible and figure out what it's saying about this that we're not already being taught. My passion became to get what the Bible said about these things back into Christian community, back into Christian hearts and lives, and particularly into the lives of Christian women, because I think we are so powerful in how we shape our families and our communities by the way that we live and what we believe and live out. So I committed myself to figuring this out, no matter what it took. How was I supposed to live? with a healthy sense and care routine for my body? How was I supposed to think about my appearance? 
How was I supposed to think about men and marriage and intimacy? And how was I supposed to relate to my family? How was I supposed to relate to God? Who was I in his eyes and who had he called me to be as a powerful woman, particularly in these areas? I determined I was going to figure it out at all costs. I was going to study everything. I was going to go to every conference. I was going to read all the books, listen to all the trainings. I was going to talk to mentors. I was going to talk to older couples. I was just going to watch the world and kind of start to figure out how is the human heart wired. And as I did, I realized over and over and over again with increasing conviction and even amazement, the Bible is right. The Bible is right. The Bible is right almost astoundingly so. Everything matters and everything is true. So I have committed my life to living out this way of being an incredibly powerful feminine woman of God and letting that spread the gospel and Christ's love to the nations. That is my goal. That's the journey I'm on and I would love for you to join me. Now there's one more part to this story and it's a lot happier than everything I've talked about so far because it's how my dedication to these certain areas that I teach on and that I'm so passionate about led finally to wellness and flourishing in those areas. I by no means have everything figured out, but I am committed to not teach on things I don't kind of have some kind of grasp on. The good news is I have a wonderful relationship with my body now. I know exactly where my beauty fits in and the kind of range of appropriateness and where and how to use it. I know how to have a flourishing and intimate relationship with a man, with God, with myself, and I know how to interact with my family and friends in the way that I'm called to. I want the same for you and I know that you can have it. So stay tuned for next week's video and I'll talk to you about the happy ending to this story. Until I see you then, make sure you're following me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest so I can keep you inspired to be this biblical bombshell. And make sure you're RSVP'd for the bombshell soiree when I'm going to talk about what it looks like to be this powerful, feminine, godly woman that's coming up in a couple weeks. The link for that is below. Until then, gorgeous, stay healthy, holy, and hot, and get out there and shine.